IKEA furniture is something I hate as a woodworker. So I'm replacing my friend's IKEA desk with something a bit more real. But while making him a new one, I made some mistakes. And I encountered a completely unexpected problem. But I managed to resolve it with something I never would have thought of. Stick around to find out. This is my friend's IKEA desk. It's got two major problems. Firstly, it's developed a dip in the center over time. And secondly, the veneer's been damaged by all his vigorous computer activities. I uh, didn't ask. We picked out this slab of camphor laurel together to replace his desk. It fit the dimensions well, and it has an interesting split down the middle that'll become a design feature. I started by debarking the slab. I've never had to peel bark off wood like this before, so it was a bit of a learning experience. The draw knife made quick work of it. My starting philosophy was to remove the weak outer layer of the bark and try and leave as much natural character as possible. So while the draw knife was fast, I was actually trying to go slow with this process because of course you can't add material back once it's gone. Once I had the worst of it gone, I switched over to my chisels. With the chisels, I could more accurately follow the contours of the wood. I wanted to try rough steel wool to get rid of the remaining bark. And I forgot to wear the gloves that I specifically bought for this, so I immediately got cut. The steel wool did what I hoped for by getting into the delicate parts of the live edge. But unfortunately it wasn't aggressive enough to take out the tooling marks left by the chisels and draw knife. I wasn't totally happy with the live edge at this point, but rather than continuing to remove material and possibly regretting it, I opted to begin working on the split instead, while I decided what I wanted to do about it. As I mentioned before, this wood is camphor laurel. It's an invasive weed here in Australia. It overtakes the natural vegetation and becomes a pain in the ass to remove. As it's commonly chopped down, this wood is in abundance and it's relatively cheap here. It can look amazing when it's finished, but I don't think I'm going to want to work with it again. It's a pretty toxic wood with a fairly pungent odor, and while I was taking the bark off, I developed a headache, and I'm reasonably sure it was because of this wood. I could be totally wrong here, but I think the outer layers of the tree are more toxic to fend off bugs, as the smell while working on the inner parts of the tree was totally different to my nose and didn't seem to affect me as much. I also actually quite enjoyed the smell of the inner tree compared to the bark. If you know what Vicks Vaporub is, it smells almost exactly like this tree because, of course, it's made from camphor. Where the split had very irregular shapes such as these, I chose to use abrasives and brushes rather than any sharp tools. I'm not using any epoxy on this slab, but I'm still clearing out these knot holes as the material in them can easily be dislodged. And in my opinion, the final piece will look better with these cleaned out. When I was clearing the live edge, I brought some of the sections down to the light sapwood, but the remaining sections of bark left me with a sort of leopard pattern. I decided I didn't like this look, so I sanded the whole thing down so that the edge of the slab was one consistent colour. This meant I lost some of the more delicate natural contours, but I think it was worth it, as I'm not after a rustic look here. Instead it should look more modern, to better fit where it's going to end up. Because the slab contains a split in the tree, I'm taking care to support the two free ends during the build. This is just a temporary solution. I'll be addressing the split in two ways soon. Right now I'm working on squaring up the slab. The bottom right corner juts out a bit too far, so that has to go. The level's giving me two points that will sit against the wall, and from this I'll square up the two ends of the slab. A trick I like is to leave some material at the start of the cut, so that when you go through the end you can hold the remaining material. This gives a clean cut without the unsupported offcut falling early and splitting the wood fibres. I'm going to do an inlay to reinforce this split, but because I chopped the end off, I'm just marking it out again so I don't forget. This slab contains the pith of the tree, and that's not just the way Mike Tyson says pith. The wood in the centre of the tree is generally more prone to movement. It was a concern of mine with picking this slab. Even though this slab was kiln dried and flattened, I found that it twisted slightly after being in my workshop for a week. I'm about to start flattening the slab back out. Normally I think it makes more sense to start this work first. 
but in this case I started the edges first to give the slab more time to acclimate to my workshop, so that if it did move I wouldn't be wasting my time. I'm going directly across the grain to avoid tearing out the wood fibres, and then I'm hitting the high spots I've marked out to flatten the surface. Rocking a flat piece of wood over the slab shows me exactly where I need to take off material. The two boards on the slab are called winding sticks, and together I can use them to sight the twist in the slab. As I take off the high points of the twist, both boards should visually come into parallel. Because of the split, the slab might as well have been two different boards, as both sections ended up cupping along their length. Leaning down like this lets me check that I'm hitting the high edges of the slab. I don't know why I didn't get any blowout planing into the split, but it's good practice to plane from the edge inwards so the blade doesn't rip the unsupported fibres out. At this point I'm done flattening the slab. I wanted a card scraped finish, but the ripples left by the scrub plane would take a while to remove with that sort of a tool. So I'm using my belt sander to quickly remove the plane tracks. I want to put a pair of sliding dovetails into the bottom of this slab, but once they're in it'll become much more difficult to prep the surface for finish, so I'm trying to do the bulk of that work now. This is a card scraper. I pretty quickly realised here that if I was going to do the whole slab holding this thing I'd destroy my thumbs. So I made myself a jig with a screw shaped thumb. A card scraper is a much safer way to take shavings from wood that doesn't have a straight grain direction. Taking shavings with a card scraper leaves a great finish that beats out sanding in my opinion. It's very similar to the shiny buttery smooth finish of a hand plane. But I don't trust a hand plane not to pull chunks of wood out of the surface of the slab in places where the grain direction changes. It's hard to capture on camera but the wood grain can reflect light in some really nice ways when it's cut rather than sanded. Which is why I found it such a shame that I encountered the following problem. I'm using the light to highlight this, but as far as I can tell, the wood has grain of alternating direction that runs in parallel to each other. Usually this wouldn't be a problem for a card scraper, but a card scraper also works better with harder and denser woods, and this wood is on the softer side. And I think because it's soft, it's still tearing up the wood fibres that run opposite the direction I'm scraping in. And I can't just turn the scraper around because the alternating grain is so close to each other. Rather than having a nice but inconsistent finish, I thought it made much more sense to abandon the card scraper and sand the surface instead. To me this is the boring route that I wanted to avoid, but I guess in this instance boring works best. I did find a way to get a shiny finish in the end, but I'll tell you about that later. This will be the underside of the desk. I'm laying out for sliding dovetails that will help stabilise the slab and prevent it from cupping. I'm not putting legs on because it's going to rest on a pair of drawers, but if that was to change in the future these will give a good location to attach legs. While picking out the slab I also got an off cut from the same species to make the rails from but it's in a rough condition and needs to be milled to size. While ripping it, it started to bind on the table saw blade, so I put a wedge in the cut to stop the pressure on the blade. I need to square this whole piece on the jointer, but it's bowed along its length, so I split it into the two rails first so I wouldn't have to take off as much material on the jointer. I'm flattening and squaring two adjacent sides, and then I'll take these back to the table saw and rip the opposite sides parallel. With the rails now cut out, I have a good idea on how large to make the grooves for the dovetails, so that's what I'll do next. I've never seen someone cut sliding dovetails with a track saw, but I figured there's no reason it shouldn't work, so I wanted to try it. Usually if you're going to do this with power tools, you'd use a router and a dovetail bit. I think if I do more of these in the future, that's what I'll end up doing, but for now I'm more experienced and comfortable with the track saw. I set the angle to 12 degrees and made absolutely sure the track was perfectly parallel on both sides to form the walls of the joint. With the walls of the joint cut in, I made a few passes between the previous cuts so that I could easily remove the waste. I uh, screwed up here while pulling the saw through. But luckily I kept the thin offcuts from the end of the slab, so I glued a piece in here. I made sure to match the grain direction, and tried to match the colour. It's on the underside though, so it doesn't really matter.
I had multiple friends and family asking if I was going to fill the crack in this slab with epoxy while I was working on it. I get why they ask. They know of it because it's popular, and it seems like the obvious thing to do with a table that has a hole in it. Before buying the slab, I worked out with my friend where his keyboard would rest, and made sure that the crack wouldn't interfere with the use of the desk. Because the crack is not in a critical location, it doesn't need to be filled, and I think leaving it open is much more interesting. I'm also a bit opposed to epoxy. I personally hate working with it. I used it on the timber trim around my tiny house to fill any holes so that water could run off the timber, purely for structural longevity. I hated the way it stuck to any tools I was using while I was trying to remove the excess. Also the fumes of epoxy are really toxic, and it made my workshop stink for weeks while it was curing. I also just don't like it from the standpoint that timber is a natural and sustainable material, and it feels like a massive cop out to bond it with plastic. That being said, I still really appreciate some of the more stunning uses of epoxy with wood. I just know I don't want to use it myself if it can be avoided. At the back of these grooves, due to the curve of the saw blade, I had to finish them off by hand. This wasn't too difficult though, as the surrounding angles are easy enough to continue with the flat back of a chisel. I used a T-bevel to match the angle of the groove onto the rail. and also to align the table saw blade. I don't have a router table set up, so this was the easiest, fastest, and most accurate way I could think of to cut these dovetails to fit. The table saw can't cut these joints out without leaving a small amount of excess. I can snap most of it off, and that leaves the corner needing to be finished. But that's easy enough to address with a chisel, and very satisfying. I put wax in the groove to reduce the friction so I can slide the rail in. The wax residue left on the rail also shows me where to take off material to get a better fit. I went back and forth taking material off and sliding the joint together until I could hammer it all the way in. This process took a while and made the tapered version of this joint look like an attractive option to me in the future. After spending so long on the first joint, I figured I would try and sneak up on a tight fit on the second rail just by using the table saw to take off material. This didn't work as well because the joint didn't end up being as tight, but it was a lot faster. Before placing the rails, I beveled the corners of the joint to protect the wood from chipping out, and also to help it slide more smoothly. After fitting the rails, I went back to take off the bottom outside corners of each. This is a simple change, but I feel it improved the appearance of these by a lot. I made sure to place the entry points for the sliding dovetails at the back of the slab, where it will be facing a wall. It's possible it won't always be against a wall though, so I'm making a piece to cover the entry point and taking care to get a tight fit where the joint would be seen. I tried to snap this off with a chisel, but it was a bit too thick. Gluing this into place ensures the dovetails can't slide out even if the joints become loose over the dry seasons. I should say, I'm making this desk for my friend because as a graphic designer he's helped me a lot over the past year. I'd have paid him for helping me, but I also know he's too good of a friend to accept any money from me. Making him this desk is a good compromise to me, as I know I want to make more pieces like this to sell. But I'm also inexperienced, so if I can build up some experience in a low risk way, like this first, and also pay him back, I consider that a win-win. I'm doing a simple inlay over the pith to reduce the chance of this split developing further. I haven't inlaid into end grain before, so I wanted to keep things simple and not do a complex shape like a bow tie. I also watched a video a while back comparing the breaking strengths of various inlay shapes across cracks, and even a simple rectangle like this is surprisingly strong, thanks to the glue bond. I 
I wanted a sequence of very intentional bow ties on top through the split in the middle. I did these on the ends of the slab so that they were hidden, and if I had put bow ties on top in these locations I feel it would have become distracting from where I wanted to draw attention. I used a framing square to help me position the bow ties along the split. I'd rather have the split inform their placement and angle so that they feel natural to the slab. This really light offcut is still camp floral. These bow ties will be a feature, so the figured grain and light colour should contrast against the slab and make them stand out. I don't have a band saw, so I cut the largest out by hand, and then I made a jig to cut the others out on my table saw. They just require a small amount of cleanup after the table saw before they're ready to go in. I held these down with some CA glue. I usually prefer to hold these down myself, but the surface around the split was still a little uneven. CA glue doesn't hold up to much force though, so it's good for a temporary bond. I'm drilling out a hole to start with, but I really need to get one of those fancy spiral router bits that you can plunge with. I made a pretty big mistake here. I had the router bit extended way too far. I should have known better than to try and remove all this waste in a single pass. I was really lucky that when I lost control the bit didn't blow out past my lines. Or that I didn't get hurt too I guess. But after lightly shitting my pants I ended up doing the rest of the work incrementally. I wanted a tight joint where the bow ties go through the middle of the split. I just chiseled these sections out as close to 90 degrees as I could, and they all ended up being perfect, which honestly surprised me. I shaved down the lower sections of these walls to make sure the bow ties would seat to the bottom of these holes, but I left the walls alone next to the split. Beveling the base of these bow ties helps with getting them in, and it also gives a place for excess glue to escape to. I didn't want a ton of glue squeeze out into the split because it'd be hard to clean up, so I put some sawdust at the edges to stop this and fill any gaps in the joinery. The long bow tie that I cut by hand required some extra persuasion to get into the hole, but the others were much easier. The longest bow tie is fairly straight grained, which is what you'd want in a bow tie for strength. The others are less so, and more figured. The way I see it, the large one's doing the heavy lifting so the others can look pretty. I cut up a popsicle stick to force glue down any of the tiny holes around the bow ties. And then I did the same with sawdust. I hand planed these most of the way down, but because the wood grain is figured, I left a small amount proud so I wouldn't tear out the bow ties below the surface of the slab. I got them flush with a belt sander and 40 grit, making sure to sand in the direction of the slab once they were flat. The belt sander can leave some heavier scratches between grits, so I checked for these with a light and removed them by hand. I sanded from 80 to 240 with the orbital, and then I finished by hand with 320 grit Cubitron sandpaper. This is easily the best sandpaper I've used, so I'll probably switch entirely to it at some point. I'd feel like a shill if I talk too much about it though, so do your own research. The desk is ready for oil at this point, but first I'm going to put my brand on the underside and date it. Spraying some water on the surface makes sure the burn doesn't spread too far. I find wiggling it a little bit while applying pressure gets the best results. On the branding of course.
While I was working on this desk, I was reading George Nakashima's book, and in it, he talked about refinishing furniture with fine steel wool and oil. This seems simple, but it was a bit of a revelation to me. I have been applying oil with rags for a while, and never would have considered applying it with steel wool. The wool polishes the timber, and I find oil applies best when you rub it in anywhere. So killing two birds with one stone, and doing both at the same time, leaves a better surface, with a similar amount of time and effort to my previous process. Before you go and do this though, test the wool on a scrap piece, because I think in some cases it could ruin the wood by reacting with the tannins and pulling out dark spots. The finish I'm using is a custom blend I've made. It's one part pure tongue oil, one part liquid beeswax, and one part mineral turpentine. In my opinion, tongue oil is perhaps the best oil you can use on wood. On its own though, it's thick and slow drying, so the terps in the mix helps to thin it out, and the beeswax adds a slight amount of moisture protection and a little more sheen. After applying the oil, I wait about 10 minutes and remove any excess with a clean rag while buffing. This keeps the finish consistent with no streaks and gives enough time for the terps to dry and the beeswax to start setting. With the desk finished, it was finally time to deliver it to my friend. I did get him to help me carry it down, and then revealed it to him. Yeah, I wasn't sure I was meant to say something for the camera. Yeah, <laughs> no, it looks fucking sick. The sun wasn't cooperating for these final shots, but I had a little helper. <laughs> if you want to see more like this, subscribe. And thanks for watching. Oh yeah, and you know that shot at the start of the video? Yeah, that was totally fake. <laughs> well. Yeah, we did it.